Hi, everyone. This is Jennifer Bagnashi with Deep Believer. Today, we have a return guest, a popular return guest. He's going to share with us today why angels are clothed and why demons are naked. On top of that, he's going to share with us the time when God was angry with him. And he's going to answer for us, can God really get angry with people? John Finn, thank you so much for being with us again today. Oh, thank you, Jennifer. That's quite a lead in on what we're going to cover, among other things, right? So we're going to start on when you were taken to East Africa and you saw angels bless a person who wasn't even Christian and of a whole different religion. Tell us that story. I appreciate that, Jennifer. No problem. Um, a lot of people know that the Lord has appeared to me and and also I see angels that he called me as a seer when I was a teenager, uh, even though I didn't see anything until I was mature and, and more balanced and stable in life and such, I think. But um, but this was early on. And this was uh, when I first realized in the visitations with the Lord, there was often an angel accompanying him who I have become accustomed to just calling him my angel, my guardian angel. And so fairly early on, after the Lord had taught me what he wanted to teach me and everything, this the angel was there and gave me the message that the Lord wanted, uh, that the Father wanted. And then he said, do you have any questions for me? And I asked him, I, I said, okay, how do, you, how do you relate to the Father? He's, you know, my thinking was the Father God is misunderstood on the earth, you know, accused of all sorts of horrible things, uh, just unknown by so many Christians who, who, Maybe have an earthly dad that isn't there or was abusive. And Jesus, they get, but they can't. They think of the Father God as like the angry guy with the baseball bat in the sky. So I was asking the angel, and because the Father's always been closest to me. I, that's that's my number one fellowship is with the Father. So I said, what is your perspective on the Father? And suddenly we were in the spirit. And, and I was, all I knew is that he said, you were in East Africa. We were standing about three feet or about a meter above the ground and standing exactly opposite this house, a small home. And there was a man there. And I, I knew uh, he looked more Arabian than African, but, you know, darker skin. But um, but I knew, you know, East Africa near the ocean. And this man was speaking in some other language and he was saying goodbye to his wife. And he had the cart uh, that he was hand, just carrying with his hand, a two wheeled cart. And he was pushing it. And as he pushed it, the angel line just kind of walked along, even though we're, you know, like I said, three feet or a meter or so above the ground. And I knew it was hot because I saw the man sweating, but I was comfortable. And as he walked, the angel uh, said to me, he said, he said, um, this man is bringing some of his vegetables to the open air market to sell. And he hopes to get a good enough price to buy uh, goats, to start uh, a flock of goats, to buy uh, a mating pair so that he can start his, his little herd. And his wife has three things that she desires that she has not told him. But your father knows that she has, has desired these things. And that is a brush, a comb, and a hand mirror. Okay, so, so I understood she had these desire that they'd have enough money from the sale for these little personal items for her. And he's thinking, I'll get enough for a couple of goats. And I could see this little house. I could see kind of what we'd call a garden or something behind a, you know, a large garden and, and other vegetables growing. And so as we go into this, he opens this inner air, open air market. And I knew it was by the sea, but there were fish there. There were vegetables. And it was just like, you know, you just walk down and there's a, a stall on either side of you. And he's there and he's looking to catch somebody's eye to, 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 you know, whoever the vendors are, you know, so that he can sell. And he gets down to the end and he turns around and I'm telling you, Jennifer, you, there was a, there was a noted look of dis disappointment on his face because nobody wanted his vegetables. And, you know, the vegetables look like, um, you know, like cabbage, like some sort of a squash, you know, that sort of a, you know, just ground vegetables. And, but it was so marked on his face that he was disappointed. And we watched him come back. And as he started to come back, the angel said to me, now watch what your father has done. And the man comes down and he gets close to like the install. And this woman comes out and she motions him over and they begin haggling. I can't understand the language, but they begin talking. There's lots of hand motions and, and hand nods and everything. And he unloads his vegetables 
And on the way home, he is he's very, very happy. He's his his face is upbeat and he's he's you know smiling, he's moving at a good pace. And as we're moving along, the angel says, Your father has arranged the price so that he'll be able to get his goats, and his wife will be able to get those three personal items that she wants. And when they got there to the house, his wife met him and they started praising, and it wasn't the God of Israel. It was the other God in the region. And they started praising and worshiping. And 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 it it struck me that here my father had provided this for them, the price to bless them. And yet they weren't worshiping him. And it, it reminded me, you know, in Hosea, I think like chapter two, the Lord talks about how he blessed Israel with grain and wine and good vet and good harvest, but they attributed their goodness or their their crops to Baal. They credited Baal with the blessing of, of the crops and the, the the wine and the oil and everything. that and, and that's what the Lord says there in Hosea chapter 2. He says they ascribed to and assigned that to Baal when they, they didn't even know it. it was I who was providing them. And that's what it reminded me of. And I looked at my angel. I was just astonished when I realized uh, what religion they're of. And this was, I mean, you're talking, this happened in, you know, 1998 or 19, excuse me, 1991 or two. So this was early on. This was before, you know, any of the wars in the Middle East and everything else. This is before 9-11. This is before everything. So this is in 1990, 1991. This is happening to me. Um, and and I looked at my angel. And I said, my father blesses them? I, 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 I said, how can, how can this be? And he looked at me with a curious look on his face. And he said, he said, have you not read the Lord said, to the your father causes the sun to shine on the just and the unjust and the rain to fall on the just and the unjust and you're commanded and aren't you commanded to be just like him i said this is wait this is great this is amazing this this needs to be on tbn this needs to be on christian tv this needs to be in charisma magazine this needs to be all over that that the father is so good like this and he looked at me even more curious and he goes he goes your father does things like this multiplied millions of times every single day all over the planet. How is it you think these things can be contained on a TV show or a magazine? Only the ages to come will reveal the goodness of your father. And boom, suddenly we were back in my living room. And it was like, you know, I'd ask the question, how does he view the father? That answered it. He, they have the angelic realm has this overall view of the father's goodness where he is kind to people, whether they know him or not. He he is good where he can do good to all people. And, and so they have a much larger perspective that helped my love walk uh, in, in treating people that, you know, as I should treat them and consider that, you know, everybody's just a heartbeat away from eternity and just a decision away from knowing the Lord. So I need to walk in love towards everybody. And it just changed my attitude. It was amazing. Wow. And John, when you said that, because I, I was going to ask you the question, why do you believe the father did that? And I was thinking how the Lord says he will cause it to rain on the just and the unjust. And that's exactly what you said just now, which rain, yeah. rain is a blessing, which is yeah. perfect. So, so John, so tell me uh, when the angel took you, was it, did you feel yourself travel or was it just instantaneously? It was instantaneously. And it it's, you know, the Apostle John writes in Revelation 1.10 that he said, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard a voice behind me and I turned around and saw and he saw the Lord in glory. And then in Revelation 4.2, he uses that same expression. I was in the spirit and I saw a door open in heaven. Then I heard a voice saying, come up here. And so when you're in the spirit, I know that physically, I'm I'm more I'm more than convinced that if physically I was still in my living room, you know, in that in the house, but in the spirit, your spirit and soul are are taken. Paul talks about in Second Corinthians chapter twelve, verses one and two, talking in the third person of himself, which was the style of the day. I knew a man in Christ about fourteen years ago who was caught up into paradise, whether in the body or not, I don't know. It's that sort of thing. It happens. It's so natural and the real you is your spirit and soul. And so you're not sure, you know, are you physically taken out or in the, or just in the spirit? And the examples are much, much more common of being there in the spirit while physically being, you know, back home or whatever the case is. Paul, 
Paul talked in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 of being in Corinth. He There was a man who had an improper relationship with his stepmother, and he talks to them and says, you should have judged this. He said, but because you haven't, I have to. So now when you're gathered together in my spirit with you, I've decided to turn him over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so his spirit can be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. That's out of 1 Corinthians 5 and about verses 3 through 5. So Paul is saying, you know, he's writing from, well, I think Ephesus is where I think he wrote to the Corinthians from. And so he's saying, hey, when you're gathered together, my spirit's with you. So there was there was something there. Can I add a, a flip side yeah, to that? Yeah, that is the, the disclaimer is this. Jennifer, there is a, a, a cult-like error uh, creeping into much of the body of Christ where they think voluntarily they can go to heaven voluntarily what the new agers call astral projection voluntarily leave their spirit uh there's a there's a term out there called um oh what is it it's like it's it's where you i'm trying to remember what it is charles spurgeon used used to use it it's like gift gift swapping or something like that where people mistakenly think if you get too close to somebody they can like steal your anointing or steal your gift charles spurgeon used it an english you know minister a century and a half ago, used it to talk about people who would try to bribe God to give money, to get his blessing or something of that nature. And, and he called it spiritual swapping. You know, you think you can give money and then swap out for, for blessings or something. But in our world, these new agey type of things, number one, Christ is in you. Nobody can take your gift. Uh, you know, what What people sometimes sense is they they get tempted, they get tested by somebody, it draws on them, and they, they fall into this error. So look, I'll say it this way, in talking about visions and visitations, heaven always initiates it. In scripture, heaven initiates it. Nobody tries to have a, a visitation. Nobody tries to do something, to see something. It's It's always heaven initiates it. You can go back to Joseph's dreams and Pharaoh's dreams and Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar. You can go all the way through to Joseph being warned of the angel or Mary with Gabriel appearing. Uh, you go to the book of Acts with the Lord appearing to Paul in Acts 18 or on the road to Damascus. Earth never initiates any supernatural experience. Heaven always initiates it. And, and that's a key element right there. If somebody says, I can at will prophesy, go to heaven, leave my body whatever, then run, don't walk to the nearest exit. I'm glad you mentioned that because you have visitations often or kind of often, right? But so what you're yeah. saying is that there's nothing that you do to try to make it happen. Right. You know, uh, you know, going back real briefly is, remember, I grew up thinking the book of Acts was normal Christianity. So I didn't seek any of these things but I thought they should be included in just your average life. And so I don't, I, to this day, I, I don't have a desire for Jesus to come and visit me. I just think this is normal. At some point, he's going to. You know, it, 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 I don't know how to describe it other than that. But if you really get in your soul, in your heart, that the book of Acts is normal Christianity, then you're not going to go seeking other things. You're just going to realize as I go through life, as I'm put in situations, it's going to happen. Um, you know, I had a friend of mine years ago who was who was prophesied over because they were going to go down to the Darien jungle and minister to the Choco Indians. The Darien is in Panama, right where Panama and Colombia meet there. And it's the densest jungle in the world. And they were called to, to minister to the Chocos, about 70,000 at the time back in the early 1980s. And there was a prophecy there about angels would be present and 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 you know, it was going to be exciting and everything. And everybody was excited except for the missionaries. And and my friend asked him, he said, Dennis, aren't you, you know, Dennis is in heaven now, but um, he said, Denny, aren't, aren't you excited? I mean, the Lord's saying that angels will be present. Angels will be at work in your ministry. That's a real confirmation from heaven. Aren't you excited? And Dennis looked at him and said, no, it means I'm going to be put in situations that I need them. Oh, wow. And I just thought that is the perspective right there. People want to see miracles, then you you'll get into situations where God does a miracle or death happens, you know, or something of that nature. So you have to weigh weigh out the balance of it. That goes with the concept. Would you rather prefer blessings or miracles? And I guess when you think about it, more likely you, pre you prefer blessings because miracles, I guess, is linked to dire situations as opposed to blessings where just good things just happen. 
Yeah, it's it's kind of like Paul is like raising that young man from the dead after he fell out of the window. It's, isn't that great? He was raised from the dead. But it's like, did you read it? Paul was talking so long into the night the guy fell asleep. He was in a situation where he had to be raised from the dead or else this <laughs> poor guy died with just, you know, such a an accident of falling asleep in the windowsill. So, <laughs> yeah, there's always balance to it. That's so true. Okay, so I wonder when you were transported from uh, the United States to East Africa, was it in real time? Was it like in, in like that day in East Africa or was it like um, years prior in a different time or years ahead or was it in a time that we're in right now? You know, that's a really good question. It It was in my time, it was late at night when I was praying and that happened. So if you fast forward about eight or 10 hours, it would have been uh, late morning, probably, uh, where that event was going on, or or early morning, somewhere in the in the morning, but daylight. So, you know, I had never thought about it until until you asked it just now. But I think that was a real time thing that was that was going on. That is so awesome. So awesome. And I I'm glad that you mentioned you mentioned a great theological point where a lot of people get mixed up where people say Paul said I was I knew a man who was out of the body or in the body but you didn't know so you say that this actually means that back in the day people actually used to speak about themselves in a third person and it wasn't like he was saying I knew somebody he was actually talking about himself because people sometimes say he he it wasn't him he knew somebody but he just didn't want to say who it was yeah, that's a good question. The style in the style of writing in the first century was to use the third person. Not only did Paul do that in 2 Corinthians 12, but Mark did it. John Mark did it in Mark chapter 14. And it's uh, verse, verse 50, 51 and 52, where it's he talks about a young man who was following Jesus and he was clothed only in a linen and they grabbed it and he ran away naked. And he uses the third person to describe himself. And, and every Bible scholar around of any of any weight acknowledges that writing style so we see that in two examples paul and and john mark there in the gospel of mark so tell us about the time when your son went on a mission trip to nigeria and he actually challenged god what happened there our youngest son went off to bible school uh colorado springs and it was a an intern uh, intern program Part of that program, they were to spend about a month in Mexico and another one a month in Nigeria. And, you know, Nigeria, northern Nigeria has had trouble with uh, with militants and, and rebels. And there were about 75 kids that were part of this group, and they were going to spend about three weeks or so in Nigeria. And they were going to bring the gospel, not only to the largely Christian southern uh, half of it, but they were going to venture for, forth into the the northern part well when we heard we as parents heard that they were going to do that and they had told the kids you know this is quite serious you're going into a situation where you could give your life for the lord you could be murdered for the lord then a lot of us parents were really upset and they're getting phone calls and everything else it's like we sent our kids to an intern program a bible school we didn't send them to go halfway around the world just to sacrifice their lives to purposely put themselves in harm's way. All right. So that's the background. So, you know, like look, my wife is saying, you know, you got to call Ted, you got to call, you know, the pastor of the church, you got to call everybody who's there now. Anyway, my wife, my wife was saying, you know, I need to call the pastor and, and everything. And I mentioned that I used to go to Colorado Springs quite frequently. And I taught uh, classes out of the world prayer center, what was called the world prayer center at the time, which was on the campus there at that church. And I said, honey, let's, let's pray. Let's see in our spirit, what the father is saying, because they can go to the most safe or the most dangerous place. But if we've got a piece about it, then we know they're going to be okay. So let's just, I just want to pray about it and, and see what we're, what's do, what we're going to do. I wasn't opposed to calling and saying, not my son, but I wanted to see if, get the mind of the father on it. So it so happened that my lawn needed mode. <laughs> so I have a tractor to uh, to mow. And, and so I'm sitting out there on my tractor mowing along and I'm praying in the spirit and I'm just thinking about, about this. And it's like, should I call? Should we, should we do? And suddenly my angel swoops in from just like that. And he's standing in front, you know, 10 or 15 feet 
you know, uh, three, four, four meters in front looking at me and he's traveling at the same speed as the tractor, but he's not moving. He's about a foot above the ground. And he looks at me and he says, he said, I've just come from, from there and everything is arranged. Your son and everyone will be fine. And I said, well, how do I know that you've come from there? How do I know? And he said, I just told you I came from there. Furthermore, your son has asked the father that he be challenged and your father has granted his request, but no harm will come to them that they will be challenged in strife and sickness on this trip. And I, and I said, okay, you're putting limits, right? I mean, you get 75 kids going to a foreign country. There's a certain amount of sickness and strife that's going to happen, you know, just because of the diet, the changes, all the, the things that are going on. So, okay, there's limits. I said, but I asked him again, I said, now, how do I know? And he told me, I told you, I just came from there. I, I don't share very often at this, but ever since, the Lord started appearing to me. There's also another guy that I call the Lieutenant who is an angel has blonde hair and he's in charge of a squad for each of our three boys, my wife and myself uh, the, of angels. And they have something to do with protection. And the Lieutenant came in there too. And he said, and he backed him up. He said, I've just come from there. Everything is arranged. They'll be fine. And I said, okay, that's it. And then boom, they were gone. And sure enough, in fact, we were talking just with my son just a week or two ago about these. And he met his wife there at the at the school. So they went there. And uh one and one of the members of our house church in one of the house churches in Tulsa also was part of that program. So it was interesting we were talking uh about that time frame. And they did have they several people did get sick and there was strife, just you know. 19 year olds, 18 year olds, just at each other. And they learned to grow through it. They learned to rise above the strife. They, they had a, a wonderful time, a challenging time, but wonderful time. Everyone was safe. And my son and daughter and future daughter-in-law came away bettered for the experience, but it was just the Lord's grace. So I never did call the pastor and tell him not to go because I had the word there that everything was arranged. And I knew ahead of time that they were going to be challenged in those two areas. So the father doesn't cause it. But, you know, there are natural pressures if you send, like I said, 75, 18-year-olds, 19-year-olds to a foreign country, foreign food, lack of sleep, dehydration, lots of travel every single day. There's just naturally going to set yourself up for strife and, and disease. So the father didn't, didn't uh, make it happen, but he knew what was happening. He was going to not intervene in the natural processes, but put limits on it so that no harm would, no, no full harm would, uh, or no permanent harm would come to them. So that's the graciousness of the father in that, that my son wanted to be challenged. And I'm going like, why did you do that? Why did you do that? Couldn't you have just said, I don't want to be challenged. I want this to be easy. But he had that in his heart and he was, it was good. It's good that and, he and, has that connection with the Lord, how you you and Barbara taught him to actually commune with the Lord because most, well, I can't say most, but a lot of youth don't know that, that they can actually go to the Lord like that. Yeah, and that's, you know, he, he was, you know, he he's now on staff with us and everything, but he was eight years a sheriff's deputy and in the National Guard. And so he was very, you know, when he's young, he's like very, geared towards law enforcement his, his degree is in criminal justice you know he's very geared towards military criminal justice etc so even as a teenager he was like hey i want to be challenged you know i want to go to nigeria and i want to be challenged and and everything else so he had that relationship with the father to be able to say okay son i'll let you be challenged no harm will come to you i'll put limits for your parents sake you know you're young but um but i'll make sure and it was just gracious of the father because if i had because of my position there in, in ministry and, and everything, I could have raised quite a, a ruckus. I could have could have really stirred the pot. And it was just the grace of the father to let me see not only my angel, but the lieutenant, the, the squad that kind of protects our family and get the, that assurance from the father through them. They'd already been there. They'd already worked everything in advance. And, and Jennifer, I, I am convinced the father does things like this for every person. I just happen to be blessed and burdened with the uh, with the grace to see into his realm quite often. And but I am convinced I'm nothing. I'm not special in that. He doesn't treat us differently. He loves us equally. 
he doesn't treat us all the same, obviously, because, you know, a, a single mother raising a child is going to be treated differently than, you know, than me, you know, in, in my age and everything else. But but the grace is there. And I'm convinced that he does things behind the scenes so often that we don't even see it with angels going here and there and everything everywhere. Um, you know, Amy Grant had a song back in what the 1980s, and there's a lyric in there about it's called I think it's called Angels Unaware, and it's, and, it, and there's a line in there that says something like a reckless car runs out of gas before it runs my way. You know, it's stuff like that that I'm convinced that the Father does all the time wow. uh, for people. Wow, wow. So when your son got back, did you ask him about the challenge? And did you tell him that an angel came to you and told him? that, okay, we know what you did. We know that you asked God for a challenge. Did you communicate with him about that? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think I told him ahead of time before they went on the trip that, you know, to be on the lookout because you're going to be challenged and, and everyone will, and hopefully he could be a blessing to help mitigate some of the effects of strife and all the things that come with being tired and international travel and everything else. So he was aware going in and uh, there were quite a few that got sick at various stages and everything. And um, but it, it turned out to be a good trip. So what did he say when you told him an angel confirmed with you about him asking the father for a challenge? He's my son. So he's kind of used to me. <laughs> yeah. you know, it's, he's it's used to it. He's like, OK, it's not unusual. Yeah, yeah. I was I, I'll tell you this, Jennifer, I'll tell you a funny and this this gives you an idea. When the boys were younger and they were uh, not yet in high school, I was getting ready for the day. I was the director of the Bible school with the big. Uh, church there in, in Tulsa. And and uh, honestly, I was just sitting on the toilet in the, you know, getting ready to take a shower and the door is shut. And I look through, I see through the door, suddenly my eyes are, my eyes are wide open, but I see through the door and my angel is standing there on the other side. And I, and I looked and I, you know, I'm looking up at the door in the natural, but I can see through it and my angel standing there. And I said, may I help you? And he said, he said, one of your, one of your boys has not done his homework. And the father's been dealing with him on this issue, but he's not done it. You need to call him on it. Wow. I said, okay. So, and he was gone. So anyway, I took my shower, got ready, got dressed. I come out. There's the boys sitting there at the table eating cereal. And I said, guys, I said, look, an angel had to appear to me. I said, the Lord's been dealing with you about doing your homework. One of you, I don't know which one he's been dealing with you. And I said, an angel had to appear to me to tell me that one of you did not do your homework. Which one was it? And I'll never forget Brian. He's, he's, he's got the spoon to his mouth like this. And he freezes. He freezes like this. And he goes, not me. <laughs> and he goes ahead and, he, and it was his other brother. <laughs> and he said, it was me. And I said, well, what's going on? He said, that's ah, just a paragraph. And I said, how long is it going to take you? He said, about 20 minutes, but it's it's due today. I said, well, get going and, and write it out. That was our life. And so it's to Brian to hear me say, okay, you know, our angel came. That's It was not unusual. So um, it's just, it, it sounds weird or to the, or just, and I don't know how to say it except it's humbling. Trust me, it's humbling. It's no, I don't want to say even terrifying. It, it's not that I, when you can see into his realm and he trusts you to see into his realm, there's a weight of responsibility that goes with it. You know, and I, I share these little stories here, but when it's happening, it seems it's very normal, very natural. On the backside, you just think, what just happened here? You know, this just really happened. And, and there's a responsibility and a weight that goes with it. And while people may sit there and they either don't believe me or they say, wow, that's amazing. Uh, can you pray, you know, Jesus would appear to me or that I'd see angels. It's like, no, I can't do all that. But there's the flip side is I know too much. I've seen too much. When I was first saved, the highway of holiness was an eight lane super highway with rubber guards on the side so that I could bounce all over that roadway. But the more you grow and the more, you know, you know, my highway of holiness now is is more like a narrow footpath with a thousand foot drop on either side. I I know too much. I've seen too much. You know what I'm saying? So there's a there's a responsibility, and I, I just I, when people talk so freely of oh I went to heaven here and I went to there and look at that and I can go to heaven at will. I'm just going like folks, you don't have a re you're not real. You know you you have to understand we're dealing with God, the creator of the universe. You know you look out at all the stars and everything that we see. 
and and realize that he used his son to create all that you know hebrews 1 verses 1 and 2 that he used his son to create all the universe and then he gave us his son which means you individually are worth more than all the stars in the universe because he gave his son to you 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 know romans 8 32 he who gave us freely his son how shall he not along with the son give you everything because he used his son to create everything so you got the son you got everything and that weight that knowledge it's it's humbling and it's 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 who am i sort of thing so i share these and they're funny or and, and and i want people to know my heart is for people to know that the lord is real that the things of the of the spirit are real i was i was changing planes in dallas one time and i saw my angel come around the bulkhead in the front and walk part way down the aisle and say watch your head on the way out he turned around walked up the aisle and went back and disappeared just as the plane was pulling into the gate you know everybody's got their hand on the seat belt ready to we're just waiting for that ding or, or feeling that the plane stopped and it happened just right before you know that happened he's watch your head on the way out okay and so then the plane stops the, the lights go off you can get up i'm getting my bag i'm waiting in line i forgot all about him i'm up there at the front i'm about to turn left the pilot's there the stewardess is there thank you for flying with us have a good day i turn my head Thank you. Have a good day. Boom, right into the, the top of the door because I'm six foot six. I'm almost two meters tall. And I, I hit my my head and I feel this muscle on the back of my neck just cramp up. I fall to my knees. I say, in the name of Jesus, be healed. And I was like, okay, I told you to be healed. Be healed. <laughs> and and everything. And the, and the stewardess is going, stay down, stay down. We'll get you a doctor. Are you okay? We'll get you a doctor. The pilot's like, it's okay, sir. You know, we'll get you a doctor. And I, I said, no. No, I'm okay. Thank you so much. I step out onto that little rounded area of the 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 jetway that they bring to you, and there's my angel, and he he goes like he goes. <laughs> he said, "I told you to watch your head." You know, I, I, it's, it's just amazing the the things that I don't know. It just happens, but I want people to know it's real. It it's. Uh, it, it, and I don't initiate it. It just is the goodness of the Father. But the, there is that trust. You have to have the word in balance. You have to know the word. You have to know his ways. Because he's not going to trust you with something that you're going to mishandle. You know, that sort of thing. And if people do, then uh, he's going to limit what you experience. And then you get ministers who, I want to say, the tail starts wagging the dog instead of the dog wagging the tail. You'll get some people. There are those out there who had like one genuine experience and built a ministry on it. And then they feel compelled to keep the ministry going. So then they have to have more experiences that are newer and greater because everyone's heard the old story. So now they have to promote a new one and then a new one and a new one. And pretty soon they are so much in the flesh saying goofy things about the Lord and heaven and their experiences that people are just going this, you know, anybody with common sense says this, we just don't see that. You don't go to heaven at will. You don't, astral project you don't do anything like that so anyway get off my soapbox a little bit but i'm just saying there's balance there's a weight there's a an importance to it there's a reverence there's a holiness to it i like how you basically show us how the lord is active and cares about every aspect of our lives from your child doing their homework to you bumping your head on an airplane so every aspect of life i like that and speaking of that you said you have a squad of angels protecting your family. Could you just mention that real quick? Explain. So how did you realize that you had a squad of angels? And how did you realize that there was a chief or a lieutenant in charge? <laughs> yeah, he was. it was early on when the Lord started appearing to me. Um, there were different times. There was a time in particular he taught me. He said, I want to teach you about angels and demons. And part of that instruction was my angel, Barb's angel, uh, the the fact that that in the gospels he says let the little children come to me because their their angels are always beholding the face of the father that was part of a jewish belief that ain't that each person had an angel and seemed to be confirmed by the lord there in the gospels and the the guy i i told barb i've told my wife before i said he looks just like a california beach boy kind of thing he's 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 tall he's got blonde straight blonde hair and and kind of long and He's got four or five others that are that are with him or more as needed. I don't know what they do. It's just I've seen them. 
you know, people talk about spiritual warfare and stuff like that. And I don't know what they do. I don't know how, I don't know how they do the things that they do or what they do. I just know that, that there are angels placed in charge, like, like in the book of revelation, we see angels in charge of churches and we see Gabe, we we're told in what Daniel 12, I think verse one and verse two, where it says that Daniel, excuse me, Michael is the angel in charge of Israel. And so we know that there are, there's this rank and file among the angels and Satan, of course, perverts all that because he can't create anything. So he perverts that and he puts his, his fallen angels in charge of you know, geographical areas and, and things of that nature. It's yeah. But I, but beyond that, I don't know. I can't tell you what they do. I don't know if it's hand in combat, if they just move in and demons have to flee. I, I don't have a clue. So do you believe that every single family have a squad of angels or only those who are rooted in the Lord and born again? Oh, wow. That's a good question. Maybe I'll tell you another story and that can address that. Okay. Obviously we had to have the Lord involved in our lives before we came to him, even his protection to allow us to live long enough to be able to believe on him. You know, I think a lot of people realize when they look back at their life and they see so many times they escape death or, or whatever the case is. And they realize it was because the Lord's grace to bring them to the point of salvation. And I think that angels are involved a lot in that, in that situation. They're ministering angels of ministering fire, ministers of fire, so to speak, uh, who are there for those who shall inherit salvation. So I think we have to have that. The, Jesus talked of the uh, in John 6, what, 44, 45, of the Father drawing people to himself. So there's that element. But let me, let me explain this. One of the times I was in Colorado Springs, uh, I was actually invited to someone's house to speak a sep to, to share a different class. I, did, I forget. I think the class was actually on how to hear the voice of the Lord, how the Father communicates. And so I stayed with this with this couple who were hosting the class, and that's where the class was. So at the end of one of the days, the four of us went out to eat. The husband and wife, me, and one other person there who was a student. So we walked into this restaurant. And it's got it's a rectangular room with with tables along the the outside, and then someone had put a row of tables together end to end in the middle, that could hold fifteen people, sixteen people, easy. And there were some adults down at one end, and there was a kid, maybe thir 12, 13 years old, at the other, all by himself. Obviously, other families had left by that point, and the, the adults at the end were just talking and you know having coffee and just talking. And this kid was all by himself. So when I walked into that room, immediately I saw an angel that was clearly the angel in charge and two or three other angels, uh, you know, angels around those adults that were there, one, one angel per adult. And we sat down in the booth there and I thought, okay, the father is letting me see that angel for a reason. I don't know why. So I just kind of turned to the angel. And if you're sitting there in that booth with me, you just saw my head turn. But in the spirit, I'm, I'm saying, okay, why am I seeing you? And so what I asked is, are these people Christians? And he said, yes, they're Christians, but they only read the Bible when they go to church. They are much more in love with the toys of this world and the things of this world than they are the things of, of the Lord. I said, okay, that's, that's interesting. You know, and, and so then I, I, I saw an angel next to this little, this boy. And I said, well, what about him? He's sitting by himself. And I asked the angel, I said, so why, why are you there? And he said this. As it stands now, and, and as he said, as it stands now, suddenly, Jennifer, there was a like a TV screen in the air. And I saw this kid on a four, on a what do you call four by, not even a side by side, a four wheeler, you know, where you sit on top of it. It's got four wheels and you take it out in the mountains or prairies or whatever and you go out. In the, so this kid had made a ramp and they there were several around and they, I saw this scene. There were several vehicles, several people, they'd made a ramp to jump. And I saw this kid go up on this with his vehicle on the jump and the thing when he went up on it the thing went over like this backwards and he and it the scene stopped just as that four by four was about to crush him and his hit, hit with the way his head and neck were just right there just as it was about to touch the ground and as that scene plays out this angel says as it stands now this young man is going to be killed when he's 15 years old on this accident 
And he said, but you can pray and ask the Father that it won't happen. And I said, okay, that explains why I'm seeing this whole thing played out. And 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 it made sense that he he said he said on that day they should have been in church, but they chose playtime over God time. Um, and this is not I, and you know me, Jennifer. This is house church. Uh, you know I do house church network. You know I am I am not geared towards the four walls of a church and everything. But this was a case where people knew where they should have been, but because of their love of the world, their misplaced priorities, they and this was probably two or three years down the road in time because this kid's only like 12 13 years old and so this was playing out in the spirit and that it was already being arranged because their hearts were so in love with the world and everything else they were christians it was more like they're adding jesus to their schedule as it's convenient for them instead of living for him and building their playtime around him so so immediately i i said i kind of the conversation with my other three companions there and i explained everything that i just said to you and the man who was a, a well-known architect at the time and very neat and orderly and everything he said this explains something he said i travel a lot and he said i will sometimes look at a person and weeping will come over me i just don't understand there's such a, a sadness in my spirit it almost hits my emotions that i want to weep and like i said he's an architect he's very you know design oriented and so he's not he's not a weepy kind of cry guy, you know, at the top of the hat, but he says, this just in my spirit, this, this, this weeping happens. And he said, when I came in to this room and I saw these adults sitting here on the end, that same thing happened. I started weeping. I started being sad in my spirit. And I was wondering what was going on. He said, now I understand the father has shown me people through the many years when people are not living for him like they should, there's a disappointment in the spirit that they're not living like they should. And that weeping, that grieving in my spirit is a reflection and a call to prayer for that, for whoever that is, that I pray for them that they will be stirred up to, to make the Lord a priority in their life. He said that same thing happened when I saw this family. So we stopped right there and we just quietly prayed. We, we said, we, we asked the father to arrange the timing of it. And we, we t told Satan to get his hands off the life of that kid in the name of Jesus. Fa and we said, Father, could you place your angels around to make sure it doesn't happen? Either they don't go at all, or if they go on that particular day, they don't build the ramp or the kid makes another change or something that it doesn't happen. And I believe we spared his life, but even though it was going to be two and a half, three years down the road. So so they have angels, but here's the thing. I, I think that our disobedience ties their hand. In fact, I know it does. I know it does. John, tell us about the time when you saw angels at church and there was an angel assigned to each person. What did you learn from that? Well, there've been a couple, uh, a couple things like that. I was ministering at a small church, 50, 60 people on a Sunday morning. And I just, as I'm talking to the people, and as I'm sharing the word, there are, equal number of angels just standing around. I mean, they're in the aisle, in the middle aisle, they're standing on the outside and crowding around the back of the church. So if there's like 60 people in the pews, they are standing around and they are paying attention to me just like the people in the pews are. And towards the end of the service, I, I then I asked my angel, I said, why are you, why do you guys do that? So that's happened a few times. You know, why are you doing that? And I've seen this, Jennifer, in, in when I ministered before, like 1,500 people on a Wednesday night service at a large church. I mean, I've, I've just it's it's pretty common. I see it in, in our house church. I see angels around just just last week. You know, I just don't say anything just because it's it's normal for me. But when I asked him about it, I said, "What you know? Why?" And he said he looked at me like, "Well, we learn. We learn from your perspective." And it ties back to an earlier conversation I had with him when I said, "You know, how do you view us?" Because we're going to be in charge of you in the ages to come. And, you know, how do you view that? And, of course, I, I think I shared that when I asked him about how do you feel that I'm going to be in charge of you in the age to come? And he said, oh, it's right. It's proper. He said, remember, we know him as creator, but you know him as savior. And he said this, the, the second part of that, what he said was this. He said, you have to understand, when we are assigned something uh, because of a prayer request of the will of the Father, he said, we see him and it all the way through we live in this realm and see your realm as well 
He said, so your walk of faith is something we don't understand. We don't understand how a person who, for the God they've never seen, just on a word, just on a leading, will pick up their lives and move halfway across a country or around the world for the God that they've never seen. He said, this is magnificent. This is amazing to us. We don't, we can't understand it because we see him and you and it all the way through. And it was just, it it helped me with just the perspective that, you know, they desire to look into the things that we have because they know him as creator, but we know him as savior. And it's a, it's, it's a life that, you know, they, they must think of us on the one hand that we are such poor, pitiful creatures. And yet at the other hand, we're so amazing that Christ is in us, that we are so loved that their creator became one of us to die for us and was raised from the dead to become basically the executor of his own estate. You know, he died to put his will into motion. Then he was raised from the dead so he could oversee the execution of, of his will and his estate. Uh, nobody else does that. No one becomes the executor of your own estate. It, it's, of course, explained in the book of Hebrews that way. But my point is that we're, we're an amazing thing to, to the angels. So they learn. Um, if I could share real quickly, take a little liberty. I, I was at an 11 o'clock service at the church where I was on staff. And the floor was had the worship team over on the left side and the pulpit in the middle. And then there was an open space on the right side as you're looking down at the at the platform and everything. And I saw a bunch of angels in the midst of the worship. There were angels, maybe 50 or 60 of them. And they were dancing and they were doing things like a, similar to like a, a line dance that you might see in Israel or Eastern Europe, you know, with the shoulders over, the guys with the shoulders over, they're, they're kicking and they're moving in and out. And then it looked like a good old American square dancing almost, where they'd come in, join hands, they'd go into the middle and out. And 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 you've got to understand these these are all look like young men um you know and it, and and it's just so innocent they're like toddlers they're such innocence such such purity and they're they weren't worshiping the lord like some people will do like an invisible like they're dancing with the invisible partner of the lord it's not like that they weren't dancing to the lord they were just in his presence and dancing and having a good time in the midst of the worship very big distinction and and so my angel was standing there. He he wasn't taking part. He was standing there down like a, by row one on the side. And he was watching his his buddies. And so I turned to him and I said, you guys dance? And he turned around to me and he said, that which is given from heaven is enjoyed in both realms. And I just thought of all the songs that had been given from heaven and how they're both, they're enjoyed in both realms. And it just gave me insight that there's this, there's a, a certain amount of camaraderie over the things which which humans and heaven hold in common. Songs that are given from heaven, messages, teaching, books, music, whatever. There's that participation because it's all in the Lord. And so there is an equal appreciation and participation in that. Well, speaking of that, what do you say to all the Christians who believe, not all the Christians, I'm not saying all Christians, but to the vast amount of Christians who would truly believe that dancing is a sin from the pits of hell. <laughs> you know, I, I just don't know what to say about that. There is dancing that is for sure suggestive and everything like that. The fact that the counterfeit exists proves the existence of the real. So, you know, when David talked about dancing before the Lord, you know, he was doing it as, unto the Lord. And, uh, and I think that a couple can dance, uh, you know, people can dance and just have a good time just to move the body. There's nothing sinful in that. Yes, it can cross a line. It can be, it can be, you know, we're, you look at some people and it's like seduction and sexual motions and, and they cross that line, you know, if they get into stuff like that, you know, if, people can cross the line into into lust and everything else and suggestiveness that's not it but just to to dance to have a good time there's no harm nor nor foul in that but that's each person has to be persuaded in and of themselves so the person who dances does so unto the lord and the person who doesn't dance doesn't dance unto the lord and as paul said in romans 14 he accepts them both when he was talking about food that you eat and days of the week that you honor. He said, the Lord accepts them both. So whether you do or whether you don't, you're doing so unto the Lord 
let everybody be fully persuaded. I agree. I agree. So question, because I know a lot of people have had this question for so many years, probably since forever. So whenever there's a congregation and say it's a tight congregation and angels are in there and say there's one person for, or one angel for every person, how do all the angels fit in the room? If you know, I've, I have literally, I have seen them floating above, like laying down uh, above. I've seen them just in the air, uh, just standing there. They're in a, another, another realm. They, they don't, there's no pass through. It's not like here's a solid person. Here's an angel. And they just pass through. There's not nothing like that. Each, each person's, you know, cause your spirit man is real in that realm. Yeah, so they, they just make room They're They're either up. I mean, they can go vertical and we can't, <laughs> you know, so it just, uh, it just makes sense. I've seen, I've seen big auditoriums where I've been in, in an auditorium of like 5,000 people. And, you know, if they were in the natural, the fire marshal would never have it because they are in the aisles and they are everywhere that people are walking and stuff like that. They're just in another realm that can't be seen. Uh, and, and sometimes down the platform, it's amazing that they learn from from things and they they of course know if there's something in the word that is being taught that's not of the lord and that's an interesting thing to see them the puzzled look on their faces but they you know they, they know what's right and what's wrong so well you know i'm so glad you mentioned how they don't pass through because we're so used to tv you know how like tv portrays angels and heaven and how because they're spirits they just pass right through um yeah. physical bodies but you say that's not how it works yeah our spirit and soul are in that realm in that eternal realm and so are they and so it's not like it's it, they just can't do it you're still a solid I, I would say not only are you solid but in some ways that realm is more solid and more real than our realm because the spiritual the unseen created the scene so it's a higher class of being it's a higher state a higher condition of existence um, and so now you, just, you can't pass through like that. So, you know, but, but the world tries to pervert and, you know, Satan will pervert everything. And, and again, the, the presence of the counterfeit tells you that there is a true, but usually the true is not as dramatic and doesn't make for as good a TV, you know? <laughs> so John, you say that you were taught how the Lord starts churches and how he shuts down churches. How does it work? <laughs> well, we know in part we prophesy in part. So I'm going to, that's the disclaimer. But I did have a visitation about how the, he said, I want to teach you about angels and demons. I want to teach you about how I start and shut down churches. This was one, <laughs> this is an interesting visitation. He, he told me, he said, when I start a church, an angel is assigned to it. And I said, I need chapter and verse on that. And he said, you've read the letters to the seven churches of Asia to the angel at Ephesus, to the angel at Sardis, et cetera. And I said, yes. And I said, some commentators think that they're talking about the pastor there, that you're actually talking to the pastor. Now, I, I had not studied at this point in my life. I had not even given house church a thought. So I didn't understand that the gift of pastor really wasn't elevated to be the main speaker until like the year 495 A.D., at what was the council of Nicaea or something. That's where they elevated the gift of pastor to become the speaker at each of the meetings. Up until that time, it was like a synagogue where there are different families who are the core leaders and those couples would, would lead that house church. So I didn't understand it at the time. So my comeback was, you know, some commentators think that, that the angel of the church at is actually talking about the pastor. And he said, no, it's, he said, it is exactly a, as it's written. It was, it, it was speaking to the angel in charge to hear what, and for the people to hear what the spirit is saying to the churches. And I, and then I came back again and I said, but, and then I started to quote a, another commentator and I said, but, but here's this commentator. Now you've got the angel and then you've got the candlestick. I said, they're saying that this is the pastor and maybe these are the, this is the board or something like that. And this is one of the, it's only happened a couple of times, Jennifer, but this is one of the times where I kept asking him questions after he'd already answered it that made him angry. This is the time when God got angry with you. Yeah. Um, and, and so when I came back about the third or fourth time with saying, but a commentary says, 
it was as if somebody turned on the gas flame to a, a, a grill or a stove or something like that. His eyes just literally was just turned into flames. And he said, I'm the one who wrote the book and I'm telling you what I meant. Or I'm telling you what I what I said. And I just went, oh, I'm sorry, Lord. And he said, it's okay. And it back and we went right back to normal. And, you know, people have the idea, God's, I hear that all the time in emails, God's mad at me. I think I, I disappointed the Lord or, or anything. You know, there are times that that we grieve him for sure. That's what the conviction of the Holy Spirit is. We sin and we know it. There's that conviction. That is absolutely disappointment. That is a grievance that that has happened in there. But to say that he's angry at you, there is not an abiding anger towards his own children. There's not, there. it's like any relationship, any conversation you could have, you can have an hour long conversation and with somebody that you love and you say something, they say something, there's a flare up, then you both regain, you apologize, sorry about that, and you go on talking. That's that's exactly how it is with the Lord. There are times in, in this visitation, at least, where uh, where I made him because I knew the answer. I it, I was just trying to cover all the bases instead of uh, accepting it. And I knew by the Spirit, I knew what he said was right. I knew the chapter and verse, and it was like it settled right, it resonated. Okay, there's angels in charge of churches. And so when I kept pressing him, that's when when he he flared up. When he talked about that, he he said this. He said, this is, this is fascinating. He said, if I decide to shut down an, a, a church because of a moral failure or they get off doctrinally and it's no longer healthy, he said, I will take that angel and I'll reassign it elsewhere. And I said, can you ex explain what that looks like, what that feels like? He said, he said, you've been to churches before where they say all the right things and they do all the right things, but you don't feel the presence, the anointing. And I said, how would you describe the anointing? And he said, he said, I, and he said, you will think of the anointing as the manifest presence of God. I said, that's a great definition. The anointing is the manifest presence of God. Manifest meaning obvious or real. So he said, he said, you've been to, to churches, he says, where they say the right things, they do the right things, but there's no anointing there. There's no presence there. He said, what you're looking for is heaven's uh, acknowledgement in, that heaven initiated that body to exist. And he said, some people, he said, even though I will reassign an angel, some churches go on uh, for, for years, decades, even centuries. They're still meeting even after I have assigned that church or that angel and, and has gone elsewhere. And I said, but I will do what I can to bless the people because they don't know any of this and their hearts are right. So I will bless them to the degree that I can bless them. But but there are many out there who I never started to, I never started that church so there isn't the angelic covering and my presence with them even though they say the right things and they do the right things but that overall awareness that this is is heaven sent is not among them and they can sense it and that was that was like a mind-blowing a mind-blowing realization that yes i remember distinctly visiting different churches and just say man they they say they're they're saying the right things they're doing the right things but there is no presence of god here at all that was exactly the kind of thing people will start a church because the man or the woman is frustrated and they want to be a pastor they think that's how their gift should flow but they don't have that gift the lord never told them to start a church even though they may tell people he did all they're doing is just trying to find an outlet for, for you know, they want to teach or they want to do something. And so, you know, he never initiated, so there's no angel involved in that. Well, so then after some of this discussion, he he was standing right in front of me because I, 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 I've been on my knees the whole time. I'd been worshiping. I'd been on my knees, and the Lord is suddenly there. And they said, I have someone I want to uh, introduce you to. And he stepped back. When he stepped back out of my field of view— there was the biggest angel that I had ever seen up to that point. He's about nine or 10 feet tall. Our, I, we were in the great room of our house, kind of a family area with the fireplace at one end and a ceiling fan up high, you know, and a, a peaked ceiling. And he was almost to the ceiling fan, 10 or 11 feet up, at least three, at least three meters, maybe three and a half or 3.25, something like that. 10 or 11 feet. And his, his face was wide. His shoulders were wide. I'm just going to tell you what I see and then people can, what I saw and people can judge from there. He had a, he had on his right side, a belt with a blade 
a, a sword that was about as long as my wife is tall, which is about five, three, about a five foot long blade. The handle was about a foot or so long, uh, kind of ornate, but practical. And the blade at the, at the hilt was, you know, this wide, six or eight inches wide, and then tapered down and had a, a bevel. The blade had a bevel on it like that. It wasn't straight steel. It had a, a side bevel. It was like this on each side. And uh, his face was copper color. His, he had gold and bronze, mostly a lot of bronze and some red. And he was just dressed like a huge old soldier. The Lord said, this is the angel in charge of your church. And he said, I'm going to let him tell a little bit from his perspective. When he spoke, Jennifer, it, you know, I've heard a lot of waterfalls in my, in my life. I've heard a lot of babbling brooks. We lived in Colorado. There are different rapids and brooks and streams and waterfalls. I've been to Niagara Falls, the Horseshoe Falls in Canada. I've been all over and each waterfall has a different pitch and a different tone to it. And the same way you and I talk and there will be a, a, a rise and a fall to each word and letter and syllable. When this, when this angel opened his mouth, it was like waterfalls. And with each word, it was like, it, it will go from a Niagara Falls to a babbling brook. As he spoke the words that he spoke, it was just like, it was just like a rush of water. It was just like waterfalls, each one. And I, it's, I can't describe it other than that. I think somewhere in the Bible, it talks about somebody talked and it was like the sound voice of rushing waters or something. That's what, if I could explain, that's what it's like. It's like different pitches of waterfalls. And he explained to me, he said, he said, many times pastors will frustrate our work in their church. And I said, what, give me an example. He said, for instance, there can be someone who's who they know is a troublemaker and is actually motivated by demons. And rather than dealing with the person, that pastor will try to reassign them to a place where they're not as visible, like maybe somewhere off in a Sunday school program or the nursery where they can't cause strife rather than dealing with the issue. He said, our job is to keep the church pure and clean and protected. And he said, the pastor undermines, very often undermines our work by noticing when people have demonic problems and rather than dealing with it, they shuffle them off to the side so that they can be silenced, keeping the demons influence in their church. And that was, that was an amazing revelation. That was like eye opening uh, for me. And I had never seen it from their perspective, but wow. since then he's now in charge of our church, church without walls, our house church network, C W O W I dot O R G. If I could put that in there. And I've seen him many times. I've seen him. I've seen different angels at different house churches as we've been around the network. And, you know, just knowing that the Lord has anointed that. You don't have to have a commission from the Lord where you feel like it. You're moved. It's like, hey, we've got it. We're going to start this. We're going to do this church in the house. And that right there being moved from heaven, from your spirit man out, automatically the Lord will, say, will often say, okay, you've got an angel. When you do that, boy, his presence is, is just there and you, you go on from there, but that, that gives you a little insight. It's, it's fascinating. So how do you know if an angel is over your ministry? Well, you'll have a, you'll have a, a witness in your spirit that what you're doing is God. There, there is the personal word, the personal revelation that that's, that's your walk with the Lord. But when his, when he has initiated what you're doing, there is this enveloping sense of his presence in your life. And in what you're doing, that's the anointing. That's the angelic covering, and the and the thing where where the Lord says, "This is this is in me. This is what I'm having doing." So you've got your personal presence where you can feel the presence of the Lord in your spirit. If you just shift your attention down to your spirit and you feel that warmth, that presence, but then there is an awareness that there is a like a covering, an anointing, a a blanket covering that that you just feel led and guided and and directed, and your steps are ordered, and you see that divine. Uh, influence. You see that divine involvement, and that's how you know that that he's there. It, it hits your spirit like that. That's good. That's good. Does that make sense? It, it does. And I want to go a little bit back to because okay. I know, like what you said, you've gotten email so many times from people who say they feel God is mad with them. Yeah. Um, and you touched on that a little bit, but could you touch on that a little bit more uh, for those who are wondering? Okay, so John, you mentioned that. You know, the Lord doesn't stay angry at his children. Um, and he's very slow to anger and it's quick, just like that. Mm. And, but this is for his children, but how about for unbelievers? Boy, there's so many different angles to, to look at this. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, 
Let me work backwards. Hebrews 12, 9 says, we submitted to the fathers of our flesh for a season, and they chastised us. How shall we not rather be subject to the father of spirits and live? What the analogy that Hebrews 12, 9 is bringing out is the fathers of your flesh correct you in your flesh, but the father of your spirit is going to correct you in your spirit. And so the father's first dealings with us is down on the inside in our spirit, in our conscience, in our awareness of right and wrong. All right. An unbeliever has that same thing. Second Corinthians 5, 17 uh, talks about how if any man's in Christ, he's a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. He goes on to say in verses 18 and 19, he says, he says that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not charging their sins to them. And he's given us a ministry of reconciliation. Therefore, be reconciled to God. For we now are like ambassadors calling people to be reconciled. So Jesus referred to, and I, I'm sorry, I don't recall where it was. He talks about the wrath of God or the, the whatever of God staying on a person. That is that the sin has, legally, the sin has been forgiven, dealt with, gone out. God's not mad at you. Uh, he's reconciled the world to himself. But on a vital basis, on a living basis, on a day-to-day -day practical basis, just because legally it's been done for you doesn't mean you're participating in what has been done for you. And so it, every person has the opportunity to take that which has been done and even though he's not angry because he put it on Christ, there are sins in our life that's, that testify against us, that we need God's solution. So it's not anger in, the, in that way, it's because he was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, but it is that our account gets full of sins and we need the remedy to take advantage of what has been provided for us. Now, I get into heaven and hell a little bit here, but but the fact is that that hell is just is just a a place for people who don't want God. That's what they've decided, and He's gracious enough to give them what He want. What He's He's gracious enough to give them what they want. And so it's not like you know the Lord is just a, a wrathful, angry God. You know you didn't do this. It's more. It's rather, hey, I provided this for you. I've reconciled the world to myself. Take the remedy please. But if you don't, I've provided a place for you. You don't want anything to do with me. I've provided a place for you. At the time, when you saw the Lord's anger for a quick second with you, because you kept asking the same questions that he already answered, were you yeah. taken aback a bit? Not really, because it's in a conversation. It was just like, oh, okay, I'm sorry. And you reflect afterward thinking, okay, what, what was the reason for that? Why is he justified in that? And it was because I, I was attacking the same thing from a different angle and I already had my answer. And, and that's the, that was the second time that I, like I said, there were two times. The, the second time was a very similar thing where I kept pressing him for, uh, for answers. It was during the Arab, what's called the Arab Spring. And so I, I kept pressing him for nation. I was going nation by nation if it was going to be affected, fall to the uprising in the Arab Spring. And the last question I asked him about was Egypt. And there was a there was a flare up there that I would just not take what he said and, and go with it. And that's when he said, what are these things to you? As for you, you must be about the father's business. And that was, uh, and that brought me back. So it's like any conversation. I mean, he's he's slow, slow to wrath, et cetera. But you, but you got to understand too that he's a human being from that standpoint. He's all God, all man, and so you're having a normal conversation. There are times you get frustrated with people because they know the answer. Look look at Mark chapter what was it? Mark chapter three verses one through six, where there's the man with the withered arm, and he says, "Hey guys, is it good to is it okay to do good on the Sabbath?" You know, if your animal falls into a pit and it's still Saturday, aren't you going to get it out? And they they would not answer. They knew the answer, but they refused to answer. And it said he became angry with them and he was grieved because of the hardness of their heart. He looked on them with anger, being grieved at the hardness of their heart. And so he told the man with withered arm to stand up and he healed him. So, so again, that was a situation where they knew the answer, but they refused to do what was right. 
And so all of us have probably experienced that in our lives where after we we know to do something and we go ahead and do it. And then, and then we just know there's this grievance in the spirit. You know, it's like, wow, I really hurt the Lord. And that's how I describe it now because we're his kids now. You know, in, in the gospel of Mark, they weren't born again. You know, the cross had not happened. But now we're his kids. Now we're, we're born again. So I wouldn't call it anger as much as I would disappointment. There's nothing in the New Testament that says the Lord gets angry with his kids, with us. There's no, nothing in there that says the wrath of God is against his own children. There's You'll never you never find, find that. Um, and so people, like any relationship, you can hurt your, your the one who's closest to you, your spouse, your friend, whatever, you can hurt them. But it doesn't it doesn't mar the whole relationship. It doesn't ruin and stain the whole relationship if you're just conversing and and say something hurtful. I want to go a little bit to when you mentioned about churches, how sometimes when they do things immorally or when they do things outside the will of God and they persist, the angels leave. And that answers a lot of questions or, yeah, for a lot of people who wonder how do churches still stand after everything that they had done? against the Lord, would you say the, because the angel leaves, the church still stands, but there's no anointing there. There's no covering. Right. Right. You, a person will go in and like I said, what the Lord said, they'll do the, what I was saying that they'll do the right, they'll sing the right songs. They'll say the right things. But the old saying, the old Oklahoma saying, or that I heard years ago was it's like washing your feet with your socks on. You know, it, it there's it, it it's it gets the job done maybe, but something's just not right, you know. And it's it's kind of it's I don't know how to describe it other than that. And the fact that he said that for years, decades, even centuries. So I can um I can um, and and you know what I asked him, I said I said if there's a change in leadership, can that be brought forth? Can can you be changed? Like you just out with the old, in with the new? And he said sometimes, but not always. And he said, especially with doctrinal error, leading my people astray, he said, he said, sometimes that can't be corrected, uh, except over the course of years. Wow. And I'll, and I'll direct them into other churches. So it was, it's pretty, it was pretty interesting the way to see that behind the scenes of just how he, he works. He's always looking for everyone's best. And, but he reserves the right as the creator. He reserves the right as the head over the church to remove his will his presence from works that are no longer doing his will or they're immoral or the people are damaged beyond being able they they just need a change of season you know and that can happen so so why do you believe the lord allows the church to still stand do you think that he's giving them some i guess leeway to come back to him you mean in, like in a situation like that yeah you where it's still st like the angel leaves the anointing leaves, but the church is still existing. Yeah, there's a certain amount of his presence in his word, in, in worship. You know, you gather together, you know, and people will worship, you know, maybe a, I don't know, youth group or something like that. But it's not like there's angel there saying, okay, this is a church and you're going to now grow and reach your community. Uh, but he, like he said, he said, I will do what I can. He said, because many people are unaware of what's going on. They, they don't know what's happened. And so I will bless them to the extent that I can. The flip side to that, when I look at it, it's like, okay, folks, if you walk in there and you don't feel his presence, then why are you there? <laughs> you know, uh, Yes, you can feel his presence in the songs because your heart is worshiping, so you feel his presence. But if you don't feel God's presence on this place and in this ministry, then go somewhere where you can. You know, I, I, I that's the important thing there. And, and people sometimes don't know, you know, don't recognize, don't know what the, the presence of the Lord is. They may think, oh, you know, the presence of the Lord isn't here because, you know, the nursery is just not up to par. Or the presence of the Lord isn't here because, you know, I just don't care for the worship. Uh, and, and that's not it at all. That's not, that's, that's just a person's own tastes and requirements and needs. I'm, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about just you walk in, you feel like, okay, God's in this place. And you may or may not be led to to be there, but at least you can say, okay, that's a good church. I know God's there. God's in that. No matter where he le may lead you. So that's good. That's good. So John, here's the big question. 
why in the world are demons naked and angels clothed? This goes back to the visitation where he was te teaching me about angels and demons. You know, I don't like to do controversial topics because Paul said, stay away from things that stir up strife and, and everything else. But I'd ask the Lord about just the way demons work. Uh, some of the things that, are, some of the teachings that are out there, everything from, you know, Genesis with supposedly angels mating with women and all the way through. And so I just asked about different things. So he said, no, he said, there's only one rebellion in heaven. And we he talked about that. He talked about how when the disciples came back in Luke 9, and they were all excited because they'd cast out demons. He said, all the they said, even the demons are subject to us. And he and he said, okay, guys, don't get so excited. I was there when Lucifer fell. You know, I saw Lucifer fall from heaven. So don't so don't get all hit, you know, hyped up on yourself. You know, that's what he was was telling them. Uh, you guys are witness of that. I was there when he actually got kicked out of heaven. And there are different things that the Lord relayed to me, but it gets back to the choice that Lucifer made and the others. And of course, Revelation chapter 12 tells us that there was war in heaven. And it says, Michael fought and his angels and the dragon fought and his angels. And we get the idea that it was about a third of the angels went with Lucifer and got kicked out of heaven. So all of that to say this, when the Lord was teaching me, he, he said, uh, when you see demons, what do they look like? And the first distinction for me is they're naked. They're different different sizes and, and heights and stuff like that. But especially the small ones, uh, I mean, they're just naked. You know, a couple feet tall uh, to, to bigger ones, but they're naked. And they look like, Jennifer, have you ever seen a person who's so wrapped up in sin and maybe they've lived 50, 60, 40, 50, 60 years, and you can tell they're in sin. Their face is weathered. They've got that, that world-weary mm -hmm. world weary look of just oppression and everything else. And you can tell, man, this person has been in the world. They have experienced the ravages of sin their whole life. And you can tell that. Okay, so imagine beings who were with God you know, before the creation as angels, and then they rejected all that, his life was taken from them, and they're left with just themselves. They are shriveled, world-weary, world-worn, shriveled, shrunk raisins of themselves. You know, they are just so, and they're stripped of everything. So I kind of relaying some of this to the Lord. I said, that's how I, re that's how I think of them. They're just kind of worn and and weary and just you know worldly looking and just naked and and he said very well and he said now when you see angels what do they look like i said well they're always clothed with beautiful clothing and and robes he said those are robes of righteousness he said because they made the right choice and so they they have been sealed they've made the decision and they've been given robes of righteousness sealed by the spirit suddenly it made sense in um matthew 20 matthew 22 12 one of the the parables of the of the marriage feast there's a man in matthew 22 12 who goes into the marriage feast and it says he had no no wedding garment on and they said why not why don't you and he was speechless and see that's that's like matthew 12 22 12 and then i think psalm 107 says let the redeemed of the lord say so and of course, Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, we believe in the heart, we confess with the mouth. So here's a man without a wedding garment. He was not clothed properly and he was speechless. He could not utter his salvation. So he was thrown out of the marriage feast. And then you have in Revelation, in the book of Revelation, you have the marriage supper of the lamb and Revelation 19 verses 7, 8, and 9 say that to those who were participating in the wedding of the lamb, marriage supper of the lamb, to them was given fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And then down in verse, I think it is 14, when Jesus returns on horses and all the the uh, the armies of heaven, and it says that all the, the armies of heaven, they are, they are clothed in those fine linen, clean and white. So, so the angels are clothed because they've made the right choice. They've, they've decided and, and demons have made the wrong choice and they were stripped of all righteousness and stripped of the life of God. And, and this is in a, 
indirect way just for everyone watching when early on when i was a christian as a teenager i thought what if ten thousand years from now i reject the lord what you know i love the lord now but i'm afraid for my salvation because what if 500 years from now, 1,000 years from now, what if I'm in heaven and I lead, I'm i like Lucifer and I lead some sort of re rebellion? I didn't trust myself. I didn't trust, you know, and what uh, what about that? And people sometimes wonder that. And it was assured me, it was, it was given me that once you have been sealed by the Holy Spirit, there's no change. You're not going to, you know, we, Ephesians 1, what is that about verse 11? After you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit and given the earnest or the down payment of our inheritance. You know, and so I there is such an assurance now that I know, of course, I would never turn away from the Lord. And, and 10,000 years from now, I'm not going to be tempted. It, there's not going to be any tempter in heaven. There's It's only righteousness. There's not even going to be the thought of, of a temptation in that. So that's why demons have been stripped. Angels have made the right decision and, and have been given robes of righteousness and they wear some beautiful clothes that is and so people good. do it in heaven too yeah that is so good so it's not only us believers who get robes of righteousness and gowns of salvation but angels get robes of righteousness as well and that's what we always see them in yeah they had they had made the decision eons ago and were rewarded for that you know john so you told me how demons work how did you find out how demons work? That was part of the visitation as well, where he talked about, I want to teach you about angels and demons. It was on a very, on a very down to earth level on a daily basis that people deal with stuff. Number one, I'm not afraid of demons and I don't want any believer to be afraid of demons. Christians always seem to, to default to the devil made me do it or the devil's harassing me. Most of the time, a person gets into trouble by their own actions, their own decisions, and then we blame it on the devil. He can certainly exacerbate. He can certainly make worse. He can enhance whatever things we've done wrong. But rel actual demons are, are relatively few from that standpoint uh, as far as just causing us trouble. They, the, the way they cause us trouble is they tempt us to go into things that we didn't, shouldn't go into. And that was the situation when the Lord was teaching me about, about how demons operate. So we're in the spirit suddenly. And I mean, uh, there's nothing else around. This is not one of those things where my eyes are open both to the natural realm and his realm. We are in the spirit. And I see a man standing and he's just standing arms down at the side. He's looking straight ahead. And he is he is enveloped in this sphere of light. There's no floor to, to make it flatten out. I mean, he's just, there's no walls. It's just about 10 feet around, you know, which would be what, three and a half meters or so around. He's, it's just, it's just a sphere all the way around him. And that's God's presence. And that's, that's the Lord's life. The, Jesus and I were standing back a little bit and it's like all around there was, there was darkness. And here's this guy in this light and, and Jesus and I are standing there and the Lord is, is instructing me. And people have to understand that in the spirit, we are light. We, that's what we look like. Uh, you know, the, the new agers and stuff, pick up on that. And they talk about a person's aura and things of that nature. That's just the counterfeit of the truth. They're just under, they're just picking up stuff on people's spirit. But when you are a Christian, you, you are light. Ephesians 5, 8 and 5, 9 says you were before times darkness. And now are you light in Christ Jesus? We literally are light. So all of this is around him. And there's two little demons, Jennifer, there's two little demons and they're about two feet tall, two and a half feet tall. And they are going all over this sphere looking for an opening into the sphere. They're just walking around slowly. And because we're behind him, the demons don't even see us. Don't even see the Lord and I. We're behind him. And he's and the Lord's just quiet, he's just quietly talking to me, just saying, Now look, he said, now this particular man has a has a habitual sin. And he opens the door to these demons about every two weeks. And he will start thinking of of sinning three or four days before. And he's making preparation for for the flesh. And I remembered, I think it's um, Romans chapter 13 and maybe verse 14, where Paul said, make not provision for the flesh. And that particular word about make not provision for the flesh, it's it's a Greek word called, um, it, it, it means it means to think ahead of time. I don't want to mess up the Greek word. It means to, to think ahead of time. It's like pronoia, which means to know ahead of time. So Paul was literally writing, don't think ahead of time how you're going to sin. 
How are you going to make provision for the flesh? And that's the way that demons work. This is what we first started. They were whispering into the sphere of light. They were whispering. And, and I could, I could, I could just, in any number of situations, you could think about a person trying to give up alcohol and they know that payday is Friday. And on Monday, they're just thinking about payday and how they're going to take 20 bucks. How can they hide it from their wife? You know, they're just going to go down just a, a 12 pack or something. And what can they say? They could lie about traffic or something like that. Or they could just, and they start thinking on Monday about how they're going to fulfill the lust on Friday. Or maybe it's a, a sexual sin in a computer or a phone or something like that. And people start thinking ahead of time about, okay, you know, it's I could just feel this building within me that I, you know. And so these demons are on the outside and they're just kind of whispering. They can't touch the guy. They can't touch the guy. They're on the outside, the sphere of light. And this man, as the Lord's narrating, he says he, he does this about every two weeks. And the time arose for that. And then suddenly this, just like a, a, a pie wedge, this it, the sphere opens up like this. And it, at, his, at his shoulders, it's as wide as his shoulders, but it's slightly, it's bigger than that, like a pie wedge out towards the, the sphere. And so these demons... It takes them a little bit, and suddenly they see that opening, and they start walking in to that opening. And as it gets more narrow, they turn sideways. They don't want to be touched by the light. And they turn sideways, and just at the last second, then they jump up on his shoulders like this. And they're talking, and, and then they go into his into his mind, and in his thoughts, he becomes, um, he thinks more frequently. I, I wouldn't, I don't know if it's obsessed, definitely not possessed, but obsessed with the thought of whatever that sin was. And the Lord didn't say, I'm throwing out examples here of, of hypothetical situations, but the Lord didn't say. And, and then he evidently sinned or something then because the Lord's narrating it. He says, and now he's repenting. Now he's, he's feeling convicted and he's apologizing to me about it. And he, he loathes himself. And I see these demons jump off and that sphere begins to close. And those demons are once again on the outside. And what the Lord taught me was from James chapter 1, and you have from verse 13 down through about 15 or 16, especially 14 and 15, where in James 1.13 it says, no, don't let anybody say that when temptations, tests, or trials happen to them, that God is doing it to them. Because God isn't tempted with temptations, tests, or trials. Neither does he tempt, test, or try anybody. But everybody is tempted when they're drawn away of their own lust and enticed. And so what the Lord shared is that the desire for sin is in this human body, this earth body. The enticing is what the demons do. So you have the desire and then you have the enticing. And, and then it says that when the enticing and the lust conceive, it conceives sin. And sin, when it's brought forth during its full gestation, will produce death. That could be death of a relationship, death of a job physical death, death of a marriage, death of a whatever the case is, that if it's allowed to go. So it all goes back to that enticing. And and that's the job, of, that's what the demons do. That's the job that they have basically is to entice us. And that's why during the temptation of Jesus, though he had no sin in his flesh, he was hungry and he was about to enter into to ministry. And there was a temptation there to prove who he was. So the enticing was what Satan was trying to do to get him to eat, to get him to prove himself, to get him to worship him, just out of the, the need to, to eat or to you know go on in life. And he, of course, Jesus passed all the temptations. But, uh, but for you and I, sometimes there are practical things we have to do, like redirect ourselves. If you feel that temptation, get it out your mouth. I'm not going to do that in the name of Jesus. And, and the other pra very practical tip is that when John the Baptist was preaching repentance, it wasn't just stop doing this. It was stop doing this and then show me proof of your repentance. Bring fruit that prove your repentance. In other words, you stop and you replace. You know, when I was a kid, my mom talked about how she had quit smoking when she got married. And, and but she said, I gained 20 pounds you know, 10 kilos because she stopped smoking, but she, but she replaced it with food and say, so, and, but it's, there's actually a biblical principle. We stop the sin, we replace it with righteousness. So like I helped one guy one time who used to go to a Friday night party every Friday night. So I helped find him a Bible study on Friday night. 
he was struggling so much just trying to stop going to the kegger try just stop trying to go to the party on friday night until i showed him stop stop just trying to stop it and start replacing it and that gets your eyes into something else so you replace if the computer's your point of sin get up and go do something else replace it you know replace that time with something if it's food replace it with something else go work in your garden go water your plants you know what i'm saying it's it's so anyway, those are some very practical ideas. But that whole mechanism about how they work was was really instructive for me. It helped me as a pastor. It's helped me personally. It's helped me on every level. Just understand the way demons are enticing. And I reached a point in my life right then that I said, I said, I so value the fellowship I have in my heart. I I, I hate the grieving. I hate that that conviction that I feel. I so love the Lord that what I look at a temptation, I say, why would I do that? That's not me. I hate the feeling of being grieved. And I, I turned my attention from that point on to saying, I'm protecting, I'm nurturing my the presence of the Lord in me. And that is most valuable. So therefore, a temptation just kind of falls by the wayside. It no longer has a voice like it used to. It doesn't have the power because I desire righteousness much more than I desire a momentary pleasure of sin. And if a person will just make that change and make that shift, and they have to remember the Lord convicts, he doesn't condemn. It gets back to that anger thing. Condemnation, here's the distinction. Condemnation is about us and pulls us away from God, pulls us into depression and disappointment. Con condemnation is about us. Conviction is about God and it pulls us to him. It draws us to him. So if a person's feeling condemnation, it's it's inward. It is, woe is me, I'm such a worm. I can't believe I did this. And conviction is, against you and you alone, Lord, have I sinned. Help me, cleanse me. It's a, it, it, That's what David recognized in Psalm 51. After he'd taken Bathsheba and had a little affair with her, after he had her husband killed, after he's confronted by, by the prophet Nathan, he says in Psalm 51, against you and you alone have I sinned, Lord. Because it's, he wasn't ignoring Bathsheba. He wasn't ignoring Uriah, her husband. He was saying, this is a true conviction, and it's drawing me to you, Lord. It's not a condemnation. It says, what have I done to Uriah? What have I done to Bathsheba? How can we go on? Which is condemnation about him. It was conviction and pulled him to the Lord. He said, against you and you alone have I sinned. Please cleanse me, creating me a new heart created me a righteousness in you. So anyway. That is good. And speaking of distinction, I've heard a few times where uh, you can distinct an angel between a demon, of course, by a lot of ways, right? Um, by their wings being sometimes pointy, they're demons. If they're rounded at the top, they're angels. But I don't know if there's true or not, but then you can correct that in a minute. I see you shaking your head. And then... <laughs> Um, and then they, I heard someone mention too, how you could tell by the sizes. So if they're little bitty little things about like two feet, like you described earlier, they're demons, but angels won't be that tiny. So like, can you differentiate between certain sizes or their wings and all that stuff? What do you say about that? And how can you differentiate? Well, I mean, the presence of the Lord can't be mistaken. Uh, you know, an angel is is like a person and they're robed in righteousness and they carry the presence of the Lord. They acknowledge Jesus as Lord. Demons are, are counterfeits and they're naked and, you know, there's no, no presence there. The, 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 usually the little guys run as soon as they see that they're seen, they are terrified. They run away. They, they're just scared. Uh, there's, there's nothing like appearance of, I, I've seen all kinds of angels. Some with wings, some with not. I've had experience with the cherubs around the throne. I've seen a big angel that was in worship in a in a church service, and they were probably ten or fifteen feet tall with huge, beautiful wings, and just a healing anointing that went out. and And the the pastor's wife, who was the worship leader at the time, correctly discerned that there was an anointing for healing, and it was right in that middle section. And I had seen when his wings beat that there was like a iridescent dust glory cloud type of thing that went out over the, the congregation right there and people testified about being healed but stuff like that it, it, it doesn't need to be complicated it, it's either the presence of the lord or it's not 
And there's no mistaking. Once you learn to trust the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth within you, and how he will bear witness in your spirit of different things, you know right away. You, you can tell when a person's got a wrong spirit about them or, you know, people turn it into such a science and it really isn't, doesn't need to be that way. It's, it's the presence of the Lord or it's not. So that goes with uh, how the Bible verse says that the devil can appear as an angel of light. But what you're saying is, and this is, I find it to be very true, is that they hold the presence and the glory of God with them. So you, you can know as opposed to wondering, they hold the glory and the power of God with them. So your spirit feels that your spirit would know. But if if it's void of that, or if it has an alternative uh, spirit to it, a demonic spirit, you could feel that as well. Absolutely. Um, I've got to quote it directly. Um, it's Second Corinthians chapter 11, and it says, Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it's no great thing if his ministers also are transformed to become like the ministers of righteousness. And it says, uh, whose end will be according to their works. So Satan can try to transform himself. But the fact that Paul recognizes that tells you that we are aware of what the devil is doing. And so he was within the context, he was talking about false ministers, false uh, servants, false Christians. And he said, if if they are wolves in sheep's clothing, it's it's isn't it in is it any wonder because Satan himself tries to transform into an angel of light. So he's talking about the deception there, not as not as literal as as people will take it, but in a first century Oriental, the Bible being an Oriental book, that's that's a, a phrase that Satan transforms himself, and he's talking about the the ministers try to make themselves sheep when in fact they're they're wolves. But now the demons are, I don't say it's no big deal. It's, I've got Christ in me. I've got the, I mean, <laughs> you've got Christ in you and you've got the name of Jesus to use. And, and, and the Lord never said to pray against a demon. You, you just take authority and command them to go and then they go. And, and so it's very simple. So it's like, I don't, I don't let them talk. I don't, I've had them talk to me before and stuff, casting them out, but it's, it's really no big deal. So if you see a two foot angel, and you feel the glory of God. It's from God, right, John? I'm not going to go by size. I've never seen a two foot <laughs> angel. I've never seen a two foot angel. And and in Scripture, they're always they're always normal human size. Yeah. Um. You know, I, I think putting measuring sticks on that by one person that you can't show in the Word. I don't think that's wise. Uh, I understand that somebody may have an experience like that and and be able to tell it, but um, no, I, I haven't. I've just all the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds that I've seen, um, they're always, they're always normal people size. Uh, except for some of the bigger, like the worship one and the angels in charge of the, the church there and, and other churches. I've seen them large before. And it's the same way people misunderstand, you know, you can have men who have the temperament and the personality that is more female. You can have women who have a more of a temperament and personality more like a male but that doesn't mean that doesn't mean anything. They're still whatever their their gender is, and there's and I don't want that confusion in the world to leak into the idea about angels. There are angels who are definitely more feminine than than other angels. In the same way, there are men who are more feminine, not effeminate, but feminine, softer than you know an average uh, average guy. That's neither here nor there. That's just temperament. That's just personality. It's no big. Uh, no big deal. So when you get to talk about an angel, oh, there's a little angel. It must be a demon. Yeah. You know, it's the presence of the Lord. It's the presence of the Lord. And I don't care whether they were more masculine or more feminine. It's angels are always he in scripture. And and that's that's what I've seen as well. Um, beyond that, it's just, it's not complicated. It, they're, it, it's just like walking around seeing people except that they've got robes of righteousness on, they wear different clothes and, and things of that nature, but it's just a par like a parallel universe when my eyes are open to it. And uh, and there's all the peace of the Lord and the presence of the Lord and such innocence. They are so innocent and, and so eager to learn and look into the things that, that we take for granted because, again, they know him as creator and we know him as savior. And I'm going to ask you, like I always do, please pray for our guests those who want to get even closer to the Lord, those who want to walk 
in the spirit and say, okay, I'm done with this lukewarm life. I'm done. I want to be a part of Jesus kingdom. I want to be his child. And like you said, how you were nervous, you were at one time, how you were nervous years down the line, say hundreds or thousands of years down the line, if you're going to turn on Christ, but you're still by his blood. I'm asking that you would pray for those who are concerned um, with their salvation and whether they'll fall. Just pray for our guests who are just yearning for more of the Lord. I'll, I'll do that. Let me, let me, if I could preface real quick, you know, when an angel's in the room, it feels like a person who's anointed by the spirit. It feels like a Christian, but it's just not as strong. It's a presence of the Lord, but it's not as strong. Demons always bring fear, confusion, strife, everything else. You feel the presence of the Lord. There's no faking that. And in the same way, a person watching today and listening, they have Christ in them and he, the Holy Spirit, will bear witness, that is testify, give evidence to them in their spirit. The real battle is of the mind. What you have to do is you have to take control of your feelings. You have to take control of your thoughts. What Paul said in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 10, which was to pull down, I think it's in verse 5, pull down imaginations. And so people are will there say, I'm afraid of my salvation. I need assurance for my salvation. You don't know what I did. And when scripture is very clear, you believe in the Lord and you confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus, you, you believe you're saved. John 3, 16, you believe on the Lord Jesus, you're saved. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. All who should believe in him will have eternal life. So you, you meet that, you have that. Now you have to believe it. You have to unbelieve the lie. You have to unbelieve the lie, the fear, and and all your thoughts and questions, and stop going by feelings. You can't make a feeling, a, 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 an emotional decision. So what I encourage you to do is say, hey, chapter and verse says I'm saved. So I take authority over the spirit of fear. I take authority over the doubts. I command you to go because the word says, you know, that I'm saved because I believe in my heart. I confess with my mouth. That's the foundation before I pray that you've got to be willing to do. Because prayer only goes so far. I can I can rebuke the devil and, and get that confusion off of you and that fear off of you, but you have to take it from there. You have to discipline your emotions, your feelings to say, I am only going to believe the word and uh, my feelings will then line up with the Holy Spirit who's bearing witness, I'm a child of the King. So in the name of Jesus, Father, we come to you and I ask that you would give the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you to everyone listening, that the eyes of their understanding would be enlightened to know the hope of the invitation that you extend to them. That the, what you say right there, Father God, in Paul's letters, that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is now at work in us. What an amazing thing. Let that reality be, be shown to them in their spirit, man. And Satan, we do take authority over the spirits of strife and confusion and fear and self-doubt and self-hatred and guilt all those different things. We command you away in the name of Jesus. Father, I ask for you to send your ministering spirits to your, your Holy Spirit just to uh, just to minister your peace. Let your peace, the wisdom from above, which is pure and peaceful and gentle, be, be just released into their minds, into their emotions, into their spirit. And let the, the thing, the wisdom of this world, the fear, the confusion, the envy, strife, and all that just be, be gone. And Father, give them the strength by your spirit in their inner man to stand against the imaginations that exalt itself themselves against the knowledge of God. Give them that strength. And we thank you for doing it, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen and amen and amen and amen. John Finn, thank you so much once again for being on. We're going to have you on again. I'm sure you already know that audience. Yes, he's going to be on again <laughs> to share more of what God has shown him, scripture and verse. Um, so John, I do want to say thank you again. Thank you, Jennifer. Appreciate it. It's been fun.